Where do we even begin with this one? With Indiana Jones 5 coming up this week, I guess there's only one thing left to do. We gotta talk about the problem child in the room. Crystal Skull is directed by Steven Spielberg, screenplay by David Kep, starring Harrison Ford, Shia LaBeouf, Kate Blanchett, and Karen Allen, taking place in the late 1950s, with Indiana Jones being tailed by the Russians in order to obtain this very special kind of artifact that's unlike anything that he's encountered before. If you ask me, it's not really interesting. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Indiana Jones 4 has been talked about to death for the last 15 years. People have been trashing this ever since its release. They would call this movie their Phantom Menace. Where do I stand on Crystal Skull? Uh, I'll be honest, I just finished watching this a few minutes ago. I haven't watched this in quite a long time, so I was really curious to see how I was gonna feel about this now. We're just gonna get right into it. I don't really love this movie, necessarily, but if you're expecting me to call this a big, giant, flaming pile of garbage, well, you're not gonna like everything I have to say here. If you're expecting me to praise this movie in contrast to all the hatred that's been thrown towards it, you're also not gonna like everything I have to say. So the film opens in 1957, where we see a group of young kids listening to Elvis, and they're starting to race these US soldiers that are driving alongside them, and it's later revealed that these American soldiers are actually Russians in disguise. And it makes a fairly fun, entertaining scene where they're trying to have some fun with these soldiers that they look up to, with the song Hound Dog playing on the radio, and they show up at this secret military base where it actually turns out to be Area 51, the same place where we see later on in the sequence that the Ark of the Covenant is being placed at. And we're reintroduced to Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, where he and his friend Mac, played by Ray Winstone, are being ordered to find the secret artifact that they're looking for, which turns out to be part of the famous Roswell incident in 1947, the UFO sightings, if you're into that sort of thing. Considering Harrison Ford's age at the time, I think he was in his mid-60s, he really does commit to a lot of these stunts, and I think for the most part, he is really great as the character. There's a couple moments, though, where I think he's kind of coasting along and not really giving it 100%. I don't really know who's to blame for that if it's really him or if it's the writing or if it's the direction from Steven Spielberg or if it's George Lucas kind of getting his hands in the pot too much even though he has a story credit in this movie. All that aside, seeing Harrison Ford as the titular character, I just couldn't help but smile when he showed up and he looks around saying, Russians. And through little bits of dialogue, we learn about his relationship with Mac or his friendship, which go south in just a few minutes after this. They served in the Second World War together to fight the Nazis, and now that here they are fighting against the Russians in the 50s. And we get introduced to Irina Spalko, played by Kate Blanchett, whose main goal is to use these extraterrestrial artifacts in order to develop these psychic abilities that she wants to enhance and use it against her enemies. But we'll get to that. Some people have said that this opening sequence is a big giant red flag, and in some ways, yeah, I would say that they're right. People have pointed out the CGI gophers that are used about three times in this opening. And I'm not the only person to say these things, but there's a couple others that I noticed too on rewatch. The lighting in particular is really off-putting. It almost looks to me like they're on a theatrical stage set. And I wonder if that was intentional by the filmmakers to try to emulate a 1950s movie set. This movie tries to use a different approach as opposed to the three that came out before this, where those three were a tribute to 1930s and 40s adventure serials. This one tries to take a B-movie approach, like a sci-fi 1950s B-movie. If you're gonna have an Indiana Jones movie take place in this time period, I don't think that's necessarily a bad style to use. But the way it's conveyed in this movie feels very artificial on my end, and it doesn't really feel like a lived-in type of world, like the original three, where it looked like they actually shot it in a real location. So eventually they find this alien coffin, and Indy tries to get the drop on the Russians, but then it's revealed that Mac is a traitor. And I'm not gonna sugarcoat it when I say this. Mac is a terribly written character in this movie. I like Ray Winstone and other films that he's been in, like The Departed, but this character is totally useless. All he really cares about is money, and his loyalties shift all over the place, and it makes his character really hard to lock down and see what his actual deal is. Sometimes in other movies that works, but here, I don't think it does. But there are small moments in this opening that we get with Indy. This line, for instance, which I've always found hilarious. No defined last words, Dr. Jones. I like Ike. And this moment as well. Damn, I thought that was closer. Probably the only time we get a sense of vulnerability in this movie from Indiana Jones. And then he makes his way to this nearby town, which turns out to be another part of this nuclear testing site, leading us to the nuking the fridge moment. <laughs> a moment among a couple others that has been over-criticized to death. But at the same time, I can't really disagree with them. This is not the first time that Indiana Jones has survived something this crazy. But still, how exactly would you be able to survive 
inside a refrigerator when you're thrown thousands of feet away from the impact site. Now, I don't necessarily blame him because it's not like there's a storm cellar or a basement that he can hide in. He's only got about maybe 30 seconds before the bomb goes off, so he's gonna go in something that probably give him some kind of protection. But I do like the lead up to it because Indy was being held in the trunk of the car until he arrives at Area 51. He's walking around this area into this town and he has really no idea what's going on. There's no water coming from the faucet and he sees the people on the couch are mannequins and then he starts to put the pieces together until the alarm goes off. In this scene, at least, the creepiness of the setup is actually fairly well done. Eventually, Indy is discovered by the U.S. government, and they determine that he's possibly a communist due to his association with Mac, even though he has another U.S. Army official trying to argue his case. He's now viewed by the United States government as a communist sympathizer, and his status as a professor is now put into question. Unfortunately... This never gets resolved. It's resolved off screen. We don't get one moment where those two FBI agents that were questioning him earlier, where they realize, oh, crap, we were wrong. He's not a communist. It gets forgotten about instantaneously, and at the ending in the movie, we see somebody painting his name on the door. So, I guess we have to assume that the FBI determined that he wasn't a communist? I don't know, the movie never tells us. But then as he starts to leave town on the train, we get introduced to Mutt Williams, played by Shia LaBeouf. Oh boy. If you're wondering what my thoughts on Shia LaBeouf are. Uh, that's a little complicated. I don't dislike the guy at all as an actor. I've seen him in other movies like Holes, Greatest Game Ever Played. I think it's a golf movie, but it's good. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Fury with Brad Pitt and Logan Lerman. And there's probably a few others that I'm forgetting as well. I think he's a very capable actor and I don't really think that he's the problem in this movie. Although maybe to a certain degree it is, whether it's him or the direction or the writing, like I said with Harrison Ford, his off-screen antics that he's been infamous for along with his role in the Transformers movies. That stuff has been talked to death before. So I'm not gonna repeat any of that stuff here. I I think in this movie he's giving the role his all, but the character is just not that interesting. To me it just feels like Shia LaBeouf is playing a variation of himself, and I don't really see much to him as a character. I don't really feel like I'm watching a character, to be honest with you. He comes off as a very typical 1950s hot-headed greaser. If you read the book The Outsiders, The Greasers and the Socius, which they actually play on that trope in the scene where he's talking with Indy about the stuff with Oxley and Akator. And to be honest, if you took the character out of the movie, really think it would have made much of a difference. If he had a different actor, though, playing him, it might have been somewhat more watchable, like, say... Maybe Logan Lerman could have played this character. That actually would have been better. And thanks to this movie, Shia LaBeouf's career didn't really recover. At least not for a while. Thankfully, he's managed to pick up the pieces of his life and his career since then. But honestly, I don't need Shia LaBeouf in this movie. I really don't. I'm ready. Don't give these pigs a thing. There is something about his bond with Indiana Jones that I've always really liked. Because for anyone who's watched this movie, if you don't remember, it turns out that he's actually Indiana Jones' son, Henry Jones III. He quits school and wants to work on motorcycles for the rest of his life. And before Indy finds out that he's his son, what, you got a problem with that? No. That's what you want to do with your life, don't let anybody tell you different. But when Marion tells him that he's his son, he does a complete 180 turn and says, you're gonna go back and finish school. We also get a fairly entertaining chase sequence where these two Russians show up at the coffee shop that they're at, Mutt's riding on the motorcycle and Indy's riding on the back of it with the Russians on their tail, crashing into the statue of Marcus Brody with the head falling into the lap of the Russian driver. Mutt's amused by that, but Indy clearly isn't. So much like your father. It's a small moment that I think kind of compensates for what they did with the statue of Marcus Brody since Denholm Elliott passed away many years ago before this one. I think it's kind of disrespectful that they did that. Oh, and also, apparently they tried to get Sean Connery to come back in this movie and he wasn't interested, so they had his character die in between three and four. Also, considering Indy's age at this point in time, there is a line that Jim Broadbent says to him. We seem to have reached the age where life stops giving us things and starts taking them away. I think it's a pretty realistic place for Indy to be in because he's at that age where he's starting to lose stuff and he's not getting any younger. They also make a joke about that in this movie with his age where Mutt says, what are you, like 80? And what do you know, he's 80 years old now with him doing Indiana Jones 5. I don't know how he has the energy to do all this stuff, but hey, if he wants to do it, more power to him. And I've always liked this line when they go into the library and they crash underneath the chairs. One of the students recognizes Indy and asks him this question about something that he's researching, and he tells him to research somebody else because the one he's looking at is not that credible. I want to be a good archaeologist. 
You gotta get out of the library! He said in one of the previous films that 90% of archaeology is reading, or some variation of that, I, I don't remember offhand. But it is true though, you can read all the stuff that you want, but until you actually go out into the world and experiment with what you know, you're not gonna get anywhere. Let's talk about the artifact of interest in this one. Basically, it's a alien skull that this ancient civilization in Peru was worshiping like a god. And according to the legend, it was an alien race that came from another place. So after digging through some research, they fly off to Peru to follow the trail of Harold Oxley, a former colleague of Indiana Jones, played by John Hurt. I'm not really a big fan of what they do with him here. But John Hurt is a fine actor. The explanation for his connection with Indiana Jones is just explained to us through a dialogue scene between Mutt and Indy. This isn't the first time an Indiana Jones film has done something like this with the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail. In this movie, it doesn't really feel that interesting. There's no sense of agency or urgency from any of these characters that want to know something about this. Indy was interested in the Ark of the Covenant and he was interested in the Holy Grail. I mean, he had to find his father along the way. There was at least a sense of urgency to find what he was looking for. In this one, he's just kind of coasting along with it and he doesn't really seem that connected to it. And it doesn't really change much when they eventually find the skull and the way he's carrying the skull around he's wowed by it but then he just casually carries it around giving all this information to mutt and us the audience the sense of wonder is gone there's nothing there so as a result i'm not really interested in it and also a small little detail that i really like is when mutt gets stung by a scorpion <laughs> runs in the family with indy being afraid of snakes and his father being afraid of rats now the third guy in the family has got another creepy crawly to worry about when it comes to scorpions the bigger the better the small one bites you don't keep it to yourself. Eventually they get captured by the Russians and they're brought to their nearby camp where Irena Spalko and Mac try to get the information that they need from Indiana Jones with the alien skull that they found in Nevada. I just realized I haven't really talked much about Spalko. Um, yeah, I don't like her. <laughs> I find her to be a very hammy and typical movie villain in this movie. Kate Blanchett is fine, and she's a really, really great actress. She's proven herself in other movies like Blue Jasmine. But her and Crystal Skull, she wants to use the knowledge that the aliens have in order to use these psychic abilities in order to control the minds of her enemies and plant these ideas in their heads so that way she could get them to do what she wants them to do. At least I think that's the idea that they were trying to go for in here, but the whole thing just feels very undercooked. And when she's using this skull to try to control Indy's mind and see if it's working, I was just sitting there thinking, why, why, why are we here? What, what is the point of all this? And it's here we're also introduced to Harold Oxley, played by John Hurt, who's clearly not in his right frame of mind. He keeps reciting all of these code phrases that he learned over the years by examining the stuff of the Crystal Skull. He was locked away in a cell where he somehow lost his mind. We're just told about it through dialogue exchange like I mentioned earlier. By the time we get to Oxley, I don't really think the needed sympathy and care for him was that well thought out. And if we couldn't get any more interesting, we get reintroduced to Marion Ravenwood, played by Karen Allen once again. It's nice to see her back after Raiders, but they don't do anything worthwhile with her. She just comes along for the ride. And they have their typical bickering that they had in the first movie, which is kind of funny in some respects, especially when the big Russian goes, oh, for love of God, shut the hell up. And when they try to escape and they fall into some quicksand or some kind of quicksand, Mutt uses a snake to pull them out. And we all know how Indy feels about snakes. <laughs> takes a lot of effort to get him to actually grab onto this thing. And to be honest, I probably would have felt the same way if I were him. Then comes another action scene when they're chasing down the Russians in the jungle. Mutt gets into a sword fight with Spalco. Indy and Marion are trying to control the truck. And then we get the infamous Mutt swinging from the trees along with the monkeys. I didn't really find it that obnoxious as some people do, but still, I found it to be very laughable. <laughs> if they had him just jumping through the trees, climbing through, with no monkeys there alongside of him, maybe just a glimpse of him going through the trees, and then he shows up on a vine at the last second, I'm just guessing, but I think that would have been okay. I don't think most people would have had a problem with that. John Williams' music in the sequence is also really fun. It's not the most memorable score from him. A lot of it's recycled from the previous three films, and the only thing that stands out in my mind when I think of the score from this movie, it's a classic dun da 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 Dun, dun, dun. Still, he's never composed a bad score, and I don't think he ever will. 
This is also a sequence where I start to notice how cheap and bad the film looks. It, to me, it looks really obvious like they shot this on a green screen set. It doesn't feel like an actual place that they shot this in. Now I get with some limitations and with certain things that you could do with CGI, you can make it look seamless where you don't really think that you're looking at a fake blue screen or whatever. The best kind of CGI is where you can't really tell if it's CGI or not. In this case though, to me it was pretty obvious. And this film came out in 2008, and we had much more up-to-date technology at the time compared to the 1980s. There's a whole lot of other things that I'm not even mentioning that I don't really have the energy to go into right now, but how exactly did Spielberg think this was okay? This is a guy who's really smart and knows what the hell he's doing. But on the one hand, he's made some movies that haven't done so good. So I guess inevitably habits are the best of them, I guess. Spielberg has publicly said that he was very disappointed with the way this turned out, including his thoughts on Temple of Doom. I guarantee you, if he had a chance to rewind the clock and do this again, it'd be a totally different movie. And then we get a creepy crawly scene with the ants. Raiders had snakes, Temple of Doom had bugs, Last Crusade had rats, and we got ants and Crystal Skull. Makes me wonder what they're gonna have next in Dial of Destiny. A couple of Russians get eaten alive by the ants, and Oxley uses a skull in order to create a safe space from the ants while Indy fights the big Russian. And this is the one scene where we can get a moment of vulnerability with Indy. This has happened in every other movie before this, where he barely escapes by the skin of his teeth, when he fights the big Nazi on the runway, the big thug on the conveyor belt, while he's being tortured by voodoo, and while he's fighting Vogel on top of the tank and hanging from the side of it. To Harrison Ford's credit, it's pretty clear that he's doing a lot of this on his own, and I have to give him a round of applause for that, especially considering his age at the time. But even so, we don't get a moment where it looks like he might not get out of this alive. Indy seems to be really on top of things. He's never really given a moment where he and us, the audience, aren't sure if he's gonna get out of this. Maybe there's a sliver of it in the opening, but that's all we get. He's able to beat the Russian with seemingly no contest, and then the Russian gets eaten alive by the ants in a very disturbing scene. And then the others manage to get away with Marion's help, where they go down three waterfalls, and they find their way to this old ancient temple, where they find a bunch of natives laying a trap for them. At this point in the movie, I have basically checked out. Going through the motions, trying to get from one place to the other while Oxley's reciting all the stuff that he's been learning about for the past several years, there's no sense of tension. I mean, there is some of it when the natives show up, but Oxley uses the skull in order to scare them away. You've basically turned on God mode by now. All the previous Indiana Jones movies felt like they had something at stake in order for him to get his hands on the artifact that he was looking for, in particular with The Last Crusade. Only the penitent man will pass. Only in the footsteps of the word will he proceed. Only a leaf from the lion's head will he prove his worth. There's nothing like that in this movie. Not at all. And Mac is just leaving these little red blinking lights as a trail for the Russians to follow him into where they're going. Which again, why do we need Mac in this movie? And at this point at least. So they find their way into this room where they have all these skeletons of the aliens sitting on the high thrones of their chairs. I guess it's the High Council or maybe it's just all part of one alien creature. I have no clue and at this point I don't really care. <laughs> Spalco finds their way back to the group, and she uses a skull to place it on the alien's body, and she asks for everything that they know. And eventually she gets overwhelmed by the knowledge that she's learning from the aliens. Keeping in vain of the trope that the villains desire to have the artifact that they want, it basically eats them alive. But like almost everything else in this movie, I don't really care if she dies or not. And the way she goes out, it's just, it's not that scary. As opposed to like Donovan when he drinks from the wrong cup and he turns into a decayed body. Or like Belloc and Raiders when he and the other Nazis get melted when they open the Ark. Or Mola Ram when he falls off the cliff and gets eaten by the alligators or crocodiles, whatever those are. And Oxley somehow manages to snap out of his hysterical mindset and becomes normal again. And Mac gets sucked away along with the other Russians that were there. The ship comes out of the ground and it disappears into thin air and all the water comes in covering its tracks. Indy asks where they've gone, into space, but Oxley says no, in the space between spaces. Interdimensional travel, I guess? Look, there's been crazier things in Indiana Jones films. Opening a secret chest where these spirits come out and they kill you if you look at them, or the Holy Grail, which is the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Those at least have some credibility to them, and the Holy Grail was a real thing that Jesus drank from. But aliens in Indiana Jones movie, I think it's a good concept, but the execution of it though, leaves some things to be desired. And there's plenty of books where Indiana Jones finds some really more outrageous stuff. In books, it's one thing, but in the movies, sometimes that doesn't always translate. But I gotta admit, I've always liked this part too. When Mutt calls Indy dad, and Oxley is kind of shocked by that, which I thought, what, you didn't know about that? And Indy says, Somewhere your grandpa is laughing. <laughs> 
I could easily imagine Sean Connery laughing his butt off from heaven over that. <laughs> So Wendy gets reinstated back into his teaching position, but he and Marion end up becoming husband and wife. Of all the women that Indy has dated over the years, they deserve each other. But there is a moment where Mutt tries to put on Indy's hat. I mean, thankfully he's not the new Indiana Jones, but just the thought of that made me shudder. Oh God. But Indy then picks it up and puts the hat back on. Thank God. Because there is no way I would have been able to sit through an Indiana Jones movie where Shia LaBeouf takes on the mantle. That was not gonna fly with me. No, sir. So, in conclusion, Candy with the Crystal Skull is not a horrible movie. Not even close. As an Indiana Jones movie, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. You got a really high bar to follow up on, and I think any sequel that takes place after The Last Crusade, it was gonna be nearly impossible to follow up on its legacy. So I don't really envy anybody who tries to make an Indiana Jones movie that takes place after the original three. Spielberg or James Mangold with Indiana Jones 5. As an action-adventure movie only, on the other hand, I would say it's okay. I've seen better, but I've also seen much worse. Probably not gonna sit well with some people, regardless of what side you're on with this one, but I just think it's all right, not good, but certainly not the disaster that people have made it out to be. I've said that a lot about other movies that I've talked about on here, but I do really mean it with this one. And that's all I really got on Indiana Jones 4. I'll be seeing Indiana Jones 5 in a few days on a Thursday night showing, and if it can be in some shape or form what Rocky 6 was for the Rocky franchise, I'll be satisfied with that. As of right now, going into it, all I can say is, let's see what they do. Thanks again, guys, for watching. Comment below and tell me what your thoughts are on Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. You like it? Or you think it's a writer? Do you absolutely despise it? Or do you love it? Either way, just keep it civil down there because I know this movie tends to get really heated conversations brewing about it. Just tread very carefully, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.